turn, if you will, to that reading that we had this evening from John chapter 19. Now we know that we're looking at this time which was very much Satan's hour and the hour of the powers of darkness. They're doing their work. And we see human nature in all its depravity and its wickedness. And yet wonderfully we see the glory and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last time we thought about three silences. There was the silence of conspiracy. At times the Pharisees were quite nice to the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, but behind the scenes they're manipulating and manoeuvring and they're conspiring against him so as to bring about his death. And in the end it will all be revealed, as we see in the reading we have, their hatred towards him. We see the silence of weakness. Pilate was between a rock and a hard place. He was somebody whose conscience was troubled, deeply troubled, by this one that he had before him. He could see the innocence of Christ. He could see his righteousness. But sadly, he was concerned for his own position and his own standing. And in the end, that triumphed. And he put self first. People today reject the Lord Jesus Christ because they see him as a threat. They worry as to what they'll actually, actually lose were they to submit to him. They beha behave just like Pilate here. Sadly, they don't realise what wonderful things they will gain if they truly submit to the Lord Jesus. But wonderfully, we saw the silence of sacrifice. We saw there the Lord Jesus Christ as a sheep before his shearers, he was dumb. He answered, but he never sought in any way to clear himself, to get himself off. He was laying down his life for the people, for his people, deliberately laying down his life for the sheep, determined to save his sheep. I wonder, do you see the need of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf? If you're not a Christian, you need that work. You need the Lord Jesus to save you. Now, one of the key things that we see throughout the scriptures is the kingship of the Redeemer, the kingship of Christ. And right from the early chapters of the uh, Bible, we can think of the book of Genesis even, we read there that a scepter shall not depart from Judah. The rule would be with one from the tribe of Judah. A king was being prophesied even of there. All the way through our call to worship tonight, the book of Jeremiah, a king shall reign and prosper. There's all this talk of the coming king. And we see tonight in this chapter, chapter 19, the passage we're going to look at, that there are many references to uh, the kingdom. There are references there to uh, the king. Uh, he's mocked by Pilate as the king of the Jews. So our title tonight is this, Christ the King. Christ the King. We're going to have three points. We're going to see firstly the rejected king, the rejected king. Secondly, the conquering king. And then thirdly, the confident king. The confident king. Well, firstly, the rejected king king. We know that Christ was the king who was promised to the Jews throughout the Old Testament. In John chapter 12 we have the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ and it says in verse 12 there of John 12 the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. He's coming there as the king. He is fulfilling the word of God. However, we know that though they praised him and in some ways accepted him, as king, outwardly, it wasn't really sincere. It wasn't really real. It was only a superficial response at the time. Uh, in the end, they would reject him. And here at the cross, that rejection is made clear. They cry, crucify him. And they are willing to prefer Barabbas, 
a thief and a murderer to Christ. They prefer him than the Lord of glory, God's only begotten son. We know that he's presented before them. Behold your king. They cry away with him, away with him. Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? What a reply, isn't it? What a reply from the Jews. We have no king but Caesar. What a thing for them to say. Those who've been looking for the Messiah are willing to even say that so as to make sure that the Lord Jesus is crucified. What trouble they had with Caesar later. What trouble they had with the one who, if you like, they'd acknowledged as their king then when he sent his armies and destroyed hundreds of thousands of Jews during the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. What trouble they had from the one they'd proclaimed as their king then at that time when Christ was being crucified. And as we said this morning, the Jews always had, even today, they still have this problem with a suffering Messiah, a suffering king. They couldn't accept this. They didn't want Christ as their Messiah because it didn't fit the picture they had of this great king, mighty king, mighty warrior. They wanted an outward, visible, military conqueror who would favour them both physically and materially, restoring their powers, their territories, their boundaries, even as far as that which Solomon enjoyed at his height. And they hated this king who was righteous, who was holy, who was harmless, who was undefiled, who was full of grace and truth. They hated him. Not only did the Jews reject Christ, but the Gentiles did too. The terrible contempt that the Gentiles showed to him, the Romans, mocking him, putting on his head a crown of thorns. We notice how concerned they were, as John details at the end of that reading that we had, how concerned they were for his tunic. Very expensive item, perhaps the most expensive item of clothing that could be worn at that time by a man. A tunic, a seamless tunic. They didn't want it spoilt or torn. So they cast lots for it. They cast lots to see who will have it because it's worthless really if it's torn. And yet they'll happily break his body. They'll happily destroy his body. They'll hammer nails into his hands and his feet. They've got respect for his clothing, but they show a contempt for him. In their eyes, he's worth nothing. He's worthless. So people still today show a contempt for Christ. They tend to show it by showing it to his people. They can't actually get hold of Christ now, so instead they show it to his people, those who Christ dwells in. So for ages, we're going to think about this tonight at the after meeting, for ages Christians have been persecuted and often Christians were given nicknames. Anabaptist, if you baptised adults, it was considered you were a rebaptizer, an Anabaptist because they'd been baptised as children. It was a name of contempt. The Puritans, the name Puritan was originally a name of contempt. The name Methodist was originally a name of contempt. God's people have been persecuted and rejected like the Saviour was by the world down through the ages. And that inscription that Pilate put there upon the cross, it was in Hebrew, in Greek and Latin, the languages, the known languages of the sort of civilised world at that time, put up to mock by Pilate, the king of the Jews, mocking them. But here is really the world and man's regard and response to Christ, the king of the Jews. Here he is, this pathetic king, showing their esteem of Christ, nothing at all really, showing their rejection of him. And really you see at Calvary, we see that both Jew and non-Jew are both involved in rejecting Christ. Who crucified 
Jesus Christ, was it the Jews? Yes. Was it the Gentiles? Yes. In fact, it was mankind showing their real response to the Lord Jesus Christ, to God's Son. Away with him. We will not have this man to rule over us. It was an act of regicide, an act of deicide. Men seeking to kill the king, men seeking to, if you like, kill God. Because they didn't want God the king, God the son, to rule over them. Now, do you know, many today say, away with him. Away with him. Many say it today. Perhaps you're saying it tonight. Perhaps you're saying tonight about the Lord Jesus. Away with him. You might say, well, that's a bit strong, is it? Isn't it? A bit of a strong thing to say. What, me? I wouldn't say that. But in your heart, in your heart, you're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to receive the truth of this message into your heart. You sort of push it away. You dismiss it. You don't want to put your life into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to submit to him. You really don't want him. You're really saying, away with him. Away with him. I will not have this man to rule over me. Away with him, is what you're saying. We don't want him to be our king. Many in the world reject Christ because they realise if they become Christians, certain things must go. Certain things they'll have to give up. So they reject the rule of Christ. We want to be rulers of our own lives. We don't want Christ to rule over us. What a terrible thing, what a sad thing. We don't want the Lord of glory, the most wonderful person there is, to rule over our lives. But you know, if Christ isn't our ruler, if Christ isn't the ruler of our lives, there is another power that is, that is ruling in our hearts, it's the power of sin and the power of Satan. That is what is ruling over us at the moment. If there is not the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is the rule of sin and of Satan. Do you prefer to be under that power than to be under the power of the Lord of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ? Just as Christ came to Jerusalem as king, he comes to you tonight. He comes to you tonight in the preaching of the gospel. He's approaching you. He's coming to you through the conviction you feel as he approaches. He's coming to you as king. How will you respond? Will you yield to him? Will you submit to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, and say, Lord, I, I submit to you. Lord, I give my life to you. I acknowledge you as, you, as my Lord. I can only look to you as my saviour. There's no, other, no one else who will save me. Or do you reject him? You say, no, away with him. Away with him. You push it away. You will not receive him. Just like these here would not receive him on that day. You'd rather have the world than Christ. You'd rather enjoy the things of this world than to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You set greater store on the things of this world and of this life than you do on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the end, the Jews suffered because they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And my friend, I have to warn you, do you think you can reject this king and prosper in the end? Do you think you will prosper if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ? No one will escape. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The Jews could not escape their folly. Neither will you in the end, my friend. And we know that even Pilate came to this calamitous end, really, as a result of his folly with Christ. So we see here, here is the rejected king. And we pray that nobody here will reject him to the eternal loss of their souls, who is here tonight, the rejected king. Secondly, we realise also here is the conquering king, the conquering king. Now notice how Christ responded to Pilate, how he responded in chapter 18 and verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. 
Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who, hear, who is of the truth hears my voice. Yes, I am a king, says Christ, and I will have a kingdom. It's not of this world, but I will have one. I will have my kingdom. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There will be a response. I will gather my subjects. I will gather my people. Amazing. You see, Christ will not be frustrated. There will be those who will receive him. How does he do it? How does he bring his subjects into his kingdom? Well, we see an example, don't we, there at the cross. We have these thieves, which we read of there in verse 18. And in Matthew we read that both reviled him, both mocked him, blasphemed him. And yet, incredibly, one was changed. One came to see his need. One came to understand who this wonderful person was, who was suffering in agony, there on the cross next to him. Though he despised Christ at first, the same as Pilate, the same as the Jews, in the end he came to love him. He came to submit to him. Lord, what submission, Lord. Calling him Lord, the one he blasphemed, he's now calling him Lord. Amazing. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He can see that he is the king and that he has a kingdom. What a work the Spirit did in the heart of that thief there on the cross. Amazingly, you see, the cross was a throne, really, for Christ. Though he's hanging on it, it's almost like a throne. There is the king, even there, bringing his subjects into submission by his power. Assuredly, today you shall be with me in paradise. What did he see? What did he see, the thief? He saw Christ's glory. He saw the glory of the Son of God, the one full of grace and truth. As he saw how he responded there on the cross, he saw the grace and the love. It melted his heart as he heard him asking for forgiveness for those who crucified him, as he heard him even committing his mother, as we'll see in the chapter that lies ahead, committing his mother, having more of a concern for his mother than for himself. What a wonderful person as he's suffering in such agony, committing her unto his beloved disciple. He sees the struggle. He hears the cries. He understands by the Spirit. The Spirit gives him grace to understand what is taking place and to see the one who is truly there. And the love of Christ melted his heart. Are you holding out? Are you rebelling against such love? The love of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you not see what the thief saw? That there is the Lord of glory, suffering in the place of sinners, the conquering king who is doing that great work whereby he is overcoming sin and death and hell through death himself. He's bearing away the punishment his people deserve, triumphing over the devil. There at the cross, do you see that? The great successful work that the conquering king has done. But not only is he a conquering king, he's a confident king. He's a confident king. So the plan of God was not frustrated by the crucifixion. The plan of God was fulfilled by the crucifixion. And this is the amazing thing, isn't it? The Lord God has a revealed will. A revealed will. And his revealed will was that Israel should accept the Lord Jesus Christ as its Messiah. And yet the Lord God also has a secret will. 
His secret will was that they would reject him. They would crucify him. And so fulfill God's eternal plan. You see, Christ's kingship didn't depend on whether or not men would receive him or reject him. His kingdom would be given to him, not by men, but by God. And that's made plain in Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Turn to Psalm 2. It's made plain there. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. There you are. That's the description of what Pilate, what the Gentiles and what the Jews were seeking to do. Taking counsel against the Lord, against his anointed, against his king. Let us cast off their bonds. Break their bonds in pieces. Cast away their cords from us. We will not have this man to rule over us. Away with him. But God is unmoved. God is unmoved. He who sits in the heavens, verse 4, shall laugh. He shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, my king, on my holy hill of Zion. He will die. He will defeat all the powers of sin and death and hell by his death. But then he will rise again, vindicated by the Father. And he will ascend up to glory. He will take that place of all authority and power there at the right hand of God. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He will have a kingdom. God will even use the very evil of men to further that end. And Christ has this confidence, you see. Christ has this confidence. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I will have a kingdom. I will have my subjects. Believe me, I will win through and accomplish all that God has purposed and planned. John chapter 6, verse 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You see, all who have been given to him will come. They will come. He will gather his people, this great king, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, the world may reject him, but God's purposes will not be thwarted. Christ's kingdom will be built. We think of the parable of the wedding feast. The Jews rejected the Lord. The Gentiles came in. Christ will succeed. He will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. His purposes will be fulfilled. His kingdom has been established. His kingdom will stand. He will have his people. This world is going from bad to worse. The changes that I've seen in my lifetime, the things which men now applaud, which once they were ashamed of, seems that they dream up from week to week, it seems, some new form of Vile activity, the throwing off of God's laws, the rejection of his son, applauding, perversion, adultery, lust, covetousness, even with this virus, even with this virus, 
There's no thought for their souls. Even with this virus, have we heard anyone say anything about God in the government or in the media? Turning to God? Nothing. Is this perhaps God's last warning unto men and women of their need to turn to God, to turn to him before he brings in the end? You see, this world is ripe for judgment. It's ripe for judgment, this world. Where is Christ? Where is the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lamb is on the throne. The Lamb is on the throne. He's ruling. He's reigning. He's bringing his people to himself. He's working out his great and mighty purposes. He's keeping his people. He's building his kingdom. The king is on his holy hill. He has the kingdom. He has the kingdom. It is his. It will never fail. Perhaps we can be troubled. Our trials, our fears. He has a perfect plan. His people are precious to him. With the apple of his eye. At times we can despair, can't we? We see sin abounding. You must remember, Christ is the confident king. He will not be thwarted. He will conquer. He has total control. And one day all will see... All of us here, every one of us here, the whole world will see. Matthew 26, verse 64. It is as you said, nevertheless I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What a terrible thing for those who rejected Christ. The one they despise to see him coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, sitting at the right hand of God on his throne. What will it be for you, my friend? Will it be the most terrible experience for you? Because you will realize he's coming as judge. He's coming as your judge. And it's the beginning of your eternal woe because now it's too late and he's coming. It's the beginning of your eternal sorrows. Or will it be such joy, such joy to see the one who was despised and rejected yet was doing that all for you because he's your king, he's your saviour, he's your Lord. You've submitted to him, you've known him in his love, you've known his salvation. Who is like Christ? There's nobody compares to Christ. What a king he is. Who is like him? Oh, what a wonderful, glorious king. Who would you have as your king? Sin and Satan to rule over you? Or will you have Christ? Will you have Christ as your king? There's no one more wonderful. Is he yours, my friend? Is he yours? Don't rebel against this one. Humble yourself. Ask him to save you. Cry to him to save you. He's willing to save you as he saved that thief on the cross. He's willing to save you and to give you that assurance that one day you will be with him, yes, in paradise. To let you know his peace, to let you know your sins are forgiven. Oh, that you might know his mercy, you might know his grace, you might know his love. The love of the king, the love of the king. Is it yours? Is it yours tonight? This wondrous love of the one who is the king.